Before we start this week's episode, a quick note about the devastation in Turkey and Syria. By now, I'm sure everyone has heard about the historic and catastrophic earthquakes that have rocked Syria and Turkey. And if you listen to this podcast, you know that my family and I have actually been living in Istanbul, Turkey for the past several years. And while I'm grateful to say that I and my family are well and safe, it's also true that thousands of people have been killed and tens of thousands of people are displaced. Turkey is already really struggling with a deep economic crisis. And also this time of year is extremely cold for this part of the world in ways that they're not necessarily set up to handle. From day one of the Travelers Podcast, we've been sponsored by Zakat Foundation. And Zakat Foundation has a huge presence and office in Turkey on the ground. The president of the organization is actually from Turkey. And if you're looking for ways to donate and contribute, we'll say more about this later, but go right now to zakat, Z-A-K-A-T dot org. Give as much as you can and know that you're donating to an organization that is very active and very present and very trustworthy. Along with thoughts and prayers and concern and care, any resources that you donate go a long way. Let's get to this episode of the Traveler's Podcast. Peace and love, everybody. I'm Brother Ali, and this is the Traveler's Podcast. I have to ask your permission at the beginning, again, for the second week in a row, um, recording this intro. The, the whole episode doesn't sound like this, just the intro and the outro. I'm speaking into my phone quietly because I'm on a spiritual journey with my wife and daughters a pilgrimage in Mecca and Medina for a week and a half. Yesterday was the 30th anniversary of me becoming a Muslim. And uh, so we're here making our pilgrimage and also just celebrating, commemorating, and just really deeply grateful for that, for the gift of Islam. So much about my life doesn't make sense in the mainstream narrative and framing of things. Um, and I don't need it to, and I wish I could do something about that. I wish I could share what I know from my lived experience. And that's a lot of what this podcast is about, because I'm not jealous or envious of anyone. And I know that I've been given the greatest gifts of all, and the greatest of them all is this spiritual uh, and religious and very physical gift of Islam. It's a lifestyle that has just benefited people all over the world. And when you're in Mecca, and especially in Medina, you really see that. This city of Medina is the city of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He came here at the invitation of this city after being persecuted by the rich elite in Mecca. His companions were killed and they tried to kill him and they were starved and they were tortured and they were exiled. And, you know, just amazing stories. Uh, and they're a multicultural group of people, people from different economic classes that really became a family based on what life is about and became a community and became a nation and became a global community of this incredible human being. And the, the, the revelation that he brought, the love that he brought, the order that he brought, the peace that he brought, the fearlessness and fighting for what's right that he brought. And not only him, but his wives and his daughters. And, you know, the women in this religion are just incredible. Incredible. And, you know, being here with my wife, and we have three daughters that I just love beyond words, and I love my son beyond words. Uh, but it's been really incredible. So, so much about Medina specifically is that you come to the, the city that the Prophet Muhammad built and the mosque that he built and the homes that he lived in. And uh, he's buried here. When you go to the Prophet's mosque in Medina, 
immediately when you enter the complex, what it is the most beautiful place on earth. I've not been everywhere, but I've been a lot of places. And there is nothing as beautiful in terms of the way that it looks, the way that it feels, the way that it smells, the spirit, the air, the bugs, the birds, the sky, the water, the, the dust, the dirt. It's just beautiful beyond words. And it's a place of humanity. You visit his resting place. And during the Hajj time, I've been here during the Hajj season, and there are millions of people here from all over the world. But even when it's not that season, there's got to be 100,000. I mean, I have no idea. There's got to be 100,000 people here. In Mecca, it's kind of chaotic. In Medina, it is not. In Medina, it's peaceful and serene and beautiful. The people are here because of a person who's passed away. And you visit him right next to his mosque, like buried, like buried in his mosque next to him are his two closest supporters. And then there's a graveyard right next to the mosque with his wives and his aunties and a woman named Halima who breastfed him as an infant and all of these incredible human beings. And so while we've been here, the earthquake has been an ever-present thing in our hearts and our minds. But then also, uh, Dave from De La Soul, Dove, passed away. And it's extremely sad. I wasn't extremely close with Dave in the sense that we talked all the time. I've never been to his house. I don't think he's, he's never been to my house. But those guys in De La, I love them. And everybody loves them. Everybody loves them. Anybody that knows them, uh, Pasta News and Maceo and Dave knows that they're just beautiful people. Their spirit and their energy and their love and their skill and their creativity. And they just were are very, very light people in terms of their, their glow and their, their gift and their energy. There are a lot of what's right about the world and about culture and about art. And the music that they made made so many people feel understood and feel okay being themselves. We love hip hop so much. We love the culture so much. You know, but from the second you make commerce out of culture, you get this thing where, like, okay, well, this thing sells a lot and you're only valuable if you sell as much as what LL sold and then the Beastie Boys came and you got to sell like that. And then, you know, NWA came and you got to sell like that. And then when DMC came, you got to, this is not in order, but you got to sell like that. And so you have to be in these frameworks and, you know, De La came along and just where they're, they're beautiful selves. And they've been that over and over and over again, not to mention the fact that their music and their ownership of it, and the control of it was stolen from them in the sharecropping, slavery-inspired music industry. And their catalog goes live for the first time ever on streaming services, March 3rd. And it's sad in the sense that Dave isn't here and like we want him here. And whenever I saw him, our connection was so just warm and beautiful. We talked about our kids and we talked about losing people. Both of us lost our parents pretty young. One of the greatest shows I've ever seen, me and Dave actually watched it together. It was Tribe Called Quest on Rock the Bells in Baltimore uh, in 2010. Uh, Tribe Called Quest and Busta was there and Nas was there and Lauren was there. And... Kamal Q-Tip was just on one. Everybody was. They were amazing. And, you know, Q-Tip was rocking in a, either a T-shirt or a tank top, I can't remember, and basketball shorts. It was just, they were just rocking, killing it so hard. They were, they were doing mostly uh, stuff. I think they were doing low-end theory. And at one point, he jumped in the crowd, and he lost his hoop shorts. He lost his basketball shorts. And he got back on stage in his boxers. And he finished the show in his boxers, man. And me and uh, Dave from De La, 
sat there and watched that show. And uh, we're just looking at each other like, my God, man. So I'm in this city that's dedicated to a person who passed away and a, 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 an entire nation, a group, a community of people from different parts of the world, different colors, different economic status, of different generations who came together to remind the world of what we're all here to do. And it just has me in this place that I try to live in because so much of our religion is physical and so much of this journey is about not being morbidly obsessed with death, but that death is forever in the focus, that we're, we're not afraid of death, but we're preparing for death at all times. And it's death that gives this thing meaning. Because of the fact it's not forever, you get one life, it's a short time, no matter how long you have, it's not about the longevity of the years, it's about what was your life like. And so I'm really sad that I'll never hug Dave again. I'll never see him again. We won't have new music from him again. You know, one of the things that Prophet Muhammad said is when people pass away, our eyes shed tears, but our tongue speaks good. And what I want to say, and just what I'm thinking about, I'm just sharing what I'm thinking about. It's not like a, a soapbox thing. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. My, my dear beloved brother Yasin Bey says on the new Black Star album, and it's one of my favorite verses of his, but he says, life, the gift, the peace and the pressure, can't remember how you came or win a bet about how you'll exit. From the start, the only thing certain is the end. It's promised to all and none know not when. He goes on and says a lot of beautiful things. I've been quoting that a lot lately because I just, I love that verse and I love him. But that is so much of what it's about. Everybody is going to die. And we keep acting surprised when people die. We don't know when our time is. We don't know how we're going to die. But we know it's going to happen. And the way that we live is what it's all about. Everybody gets a death. Not everybody lives beautifully. And so... <sighs> The people that live beautifully are winners, no matter how long, no matter how many days they have, no matter how many breaths they have, no matter how many years they have, no matter what their age is. The people who live beautifully and give to others and share their gifts with other people and make life beautiful for other people those people are the winners. So we love them so much because they're so beautiful. And we don't want to be here without them. And now we got to be here without them. So that's why the eyes shed tears. But the tongue speaks good. Everybody dies. Not everybody lives like that man did. Not everybody understands and he understood from so young all three of them those brothers are so beautiful pasta news is so beautiful maceo is so beautiful dave is and was so beautiful and their music is is amazing and like most true creative artists their music is just the breeze from the oasis that is them. It's just the reflection from the ocean that is the actual person. I, I also believe, as most people throughout the history of time believed, that this is not the end and that this particular stage of our journey in this world is the most difficult, confusing, conflicting, contradictory part of our journey. Amir Suleiman says, those people aren't dead. They're done with death. We're dying. They're done with death. The Quran says, don't speak about the people who have given their lives for their mission. You know, martyrs come in many shapes. It's not only people that die on a battlefield. And it's certainly not people that kill innocent people and kill themselves. 
That is not martyrdom. That's false martyrdom. That's what's so evil about it. That's false martyrdoms. And, and the Quran says, uh, Allah says, don't speak about them as though they're dead. They are alive. And you're just not perceiving it. And our heart is that we don't see him now. And we don't hold him now. And we don't hear his voice now. And he doesn't smile at us now. But and, and then in the third chapter, that's the second chapter, the third chapter of the Quran, Allah says, don't even count them among your dead. They're actually receiving sustenance from the source of all things. And so this part of the journey is one part, and it's the hardest part. And the next part is not like this. And so we say, from Allah we come, from the source we come, and to the source we belong. Inna ilayhi wa inna, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To the source we belong, from the source we come, and to the source we return. We know uh, that our brother's done with this part of the journey. And like, yeah, we don't want to be here without him. But he's successful. He did what life is about. He lived his life for what life is for. And he gave his gift to the world. A lot of people live a lot longer. And I, I pray that we have long lives, but a lot of people live a lot longer and they don't do that. They miss that. So it's like, I'm happy for my man. I'm happy for him. And I, I hope that doesn't sound crazy to all the other people that miss him. But I'm happy for him because he succeeded. Uh, sorry. Because <laughs> now I got to switch gears into this, this, what this episode is. I guess this week is my friend, longtime collaborator, Joe Mabbitt. Joe Mabbitt is the studio engineer who had a major hand in recording and even a, a hand in producing and crafting and shaping and molding the sound of the musical movement that I'm, that I came up in, uh, Rhyme Sayers and as a label and the Twin City sound of underground hip hop music. So much of it is related to Joe Mabbitt and comes directly out of Joe Mabbitt. It went through his hands as an engineer and his heart as a creative person and as a human being is in that music. The first round of Rhyme Sayers records were recorded at Sadiq's house, uh, the president and the head of the label. Uh, so I wasn't there for Overcast and for the Dino Spectrum and for Beyond Comparison and those early recordings. A lot of those were recorded at Sadiq's house. They were recorded initially on a four-track cassette recorder at Ant's house. But uh, from the time of God Loves Ugly and Seven's Travels, those formative Atmosphere albums when Atmosphere was having their breakout moment. Uh, and then also my first several albums, Shadows on the Sun, the Champion EP, uh, Undisputed Truth, The Truth Is Here EP, the Us album. Those were all recorded and mixed and in certain ways co-produced by Joe Mabbitt. Of course, Anthony Ant produced the records, but Joe had a hand in crafting that sound. And then he also started working with the Twin Cities hip hop scene on a broader scale. So working with the High Respects and with POS and with Dessa and with a lot of the people in the Doomtree crew uh, and many, many more. You know, Joe is a really important piece of the puzzle. And what's amazing about engineers, and they're oftentimes overlooked, is that they see a side of the artists that nobody else gets to see. Because when an artist is in that vocal booth recording, or when the producer and the artist is sitting there crafting this album and making decisions about how it's going to sound and how it's going to be presented and the order of the songs and the arrangement of the songs and discovering new things. Well, what if we take these instruments out and just play this? Oh my God, you get goosebumps. You know, he's there for that. He's there for all of that. And he sees us in ways because of the fact that we're so up close and personal on our art. And then the world hears it when it's done. But he's there for a major important piece of that process. 
And so I wanted to have him and his story and his insights and his wisdom documented here so that uh, it could be heard. We're brought to you as always by the Zakat Foundation. Uh, Zakat.org is where you can go right now and donate for earthquake relief and a hundred other great super dope projects that they do. We're also sponsored, we have a partnership really with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that's really great if you want to do some therapy and you can't just walk into a therapy office right now. You go to BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers and um, you start right away. I mean, you, you're communicating with the therapist really quickly. And um, when you use that code, you get a discount and we get a commission to help us out with the work that we do here on the Travelers Podcast. So enjoy this episode. If you listen a lot, you probably can feel that I might do a solo episode just unpacking what this last week and a half has been like for me and for my family, but very, very grateful. Now you get to hear me in a regular state in a real studio. <laughs> enjoy this episode of Travelers Podcast. It's crazy, man. Me, me and you haven't talked directly in years. Like we spent a lot of time in very close quarters for a, at least yeah, yeah. 15 years and then haven't talked at all in at least five. And then one day you just up and sent me a voice memo. You know, like, I'm in Istanbul. <laughs> just like, yeah, you are. That's awesome. It's great to see your face though, man. It's, 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 it's a lovely thing. Yeah, same. Yeah. Same. You know, we were able to talk to Young Guru. Awesome. On the podcast. That's amazing. And I think it's it's really important as much as possible to, with these conversations, like just share as many perspectives on art and culture and the human beings behind it and the process with people. It's like one of the really beautiful opportunities we have with all this technology and podcasting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, there's a sound that people have and there's music that lives in their hearts. And especially when you start dealing with people's catalogs and with like, you know, whole movements of music. And a lot of times we attribute that stuff to the artists and that's good. But there are people who really have a hand in that that we don't always hear from. And I really, I know that the engineers are really important in that process mm. and in that creation. And so I'm really grateful that we're able to have an opportunity to hear from you and your experience and your insights into this this whole thing. Yeah, man, I'm happy to, I, you know, I like nerding out talking about stuff. And I'm an engineer because I'm a failed artist. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is like engineering is supposed to be my backup plan. Uh. And then, uh, you know, just turned out to be like the thing I actually was really better at than my initial plan. But I still, you know, because of that, I still get to be as deeply immersed in music as I want to be and still get to do what I love, you know? What was your initial relationship with music and your initial exposure? What what kind of music was it? Where was it? How did you listen to it? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, my mom... Uh, was the kind of the, the catalyst to it all she you know she sang and played guitar in coffee shops in college and all that kind of stuff so it was just music was always on in the house it was just the radio was always on it was there was never it was never quiet in our house and then i have an older brother who was like he's five years older than me so a lot of stuff you know was heavily influenced by him just showing me music um so really it's just you know, it's just a thing that was just always there, always, always something in the background being played. I was drawn to drums. I just, you know, from, I remember not being taller than the, the kitchen countertops, you know, pulling all the pots and pans out of the cabinets and just grabbing the wooden spoons and just smashing everything, you know, it's just banging on everything, setting up as many things as I could just to make all the noises I could. And that was from like <clears throat> age two. Mm. It, it just was always there and my mom got me a drum set you know my first like kid drum set when i was four or five and then got me my first real drum set because i would just would you know beat the hell out of those things and so she 
got me my first real kit when I was like 10 or something. And by the time I was 11, I was in bands you know, I was, I was 11 years old playing in, uh, bands with 19 year olds and playing at college shows and things like that. So crazy. <laughs> so it's just, you know, yeah, it's just a thing that's just like, has always been there. Was, there was nothing else, no, nothing else I ever thought about, nothing else I ever want to do. You know, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. I grew up on a farm. Uh, so there was nothing else to do, you know, other than do whatever rural kids do. But I was just drawn to music and I just always wanted to play. By the time I had a driver's license, that was my weekend gig. Well, my weekend was spent playing shows at all of the rural bars. You know, I was 16 through 18 uh, playing in bands and just doing that. And then uh, it became very clear that, you know, this is this is just something I need to be involved in all the time. Music. So this is kind of the, the path I chose or really it chose me. You know, this is the path I went down. But really, you know, it's my mom. Yeah, my mom is the one, one who jumped it all off. So she's playing the guitar. That's like singer songwriter, Cat Stevens yep. type of. Yeah, Cat Stevens, Puff the you Magic know, Crosby, Dragon, and Crosby, yeah. Stills, and Nash, all that kind of stuff. You know, she was big. I mean, my mom. You know, she saw Led Zeppelin at a you know at a small college town, Ripon, Wisconsin, when they weren't like really that big, and she exposed me to a lot of a lot of stuff. Shows didn't come to where I live, but you know, anytime something did, she took me. You know, yeah. she wanted me to, and she, you know, she get me front and center and watching the band, and you know, just making sure I had those experiences, and because she could tell, obviously, this is like the the thing that I wanted to be and do. And then your brother, your big brother, that was like rock, and when you were playing, like that was, I'm, I'm assuming that was mostly rock music. All rock, yeah. ACT. Although he, Public Enemy, he's the one who introduced me to Public Enemy. So, Aha, uh, you know, okay. I was listening. I was listening to ACDC and Public Enemy at the same time, and then Van Halen, and you know, all the you know, all the Wisconsin rock and roll you can get your hands on. But Public Enemy, and I just remember being like, well, "Wait a minute, what's this? This is different," you know. And so that was my first exposure to hip hop. And then, you know, I ignored it for years because I was so uber hyper focused on playing drums and being in rock bands. But, you know, whatever, 10 years later, to then all of a sudden be just completely immersed in hip hop and just being like, huh, it's interesting that that little nugget, you know, when I was whatever, 10 years old, still resonated, you know. But yeah, and my brother and I, we played in bands together, you know, uh, he plays guitar as well. So he's, he's still playing um, more of as a hobby and, you know, a fun pastime kind of thing. But so, you know, and then I have another brother that we actually played in bands together and and, you know, played a bunch of shows together and stuff. So it's just it's it, it was a family thing at first, you know, Dope. and then morphed into a career. Did you have a particular like love for sonics and for sound like did you have like you know sound system and speakers and were you into gear and tech and all that stuff not at all man like i you know i didn't step foot into a recording studio until i i decided that this was going to be a a thing i should do but i was so focused on playing i was more just about like immersing myself in sound and music and not necessarily focused on like oh listen to that bass line or listen to, you know listen to that listen to that snare sound or whatever you know it was it was more so just like this makes me feel good i you know i want to be around this and i'll be in it and all that kind of stuff and it you know it wasn't when it wasn't until i was 18 i moved to arizona and went to this strip mall uh recording school at the time and uh you know, one of my instructors there was just like, uh, be prepared to have this ruin your existence of what you think music is. He's like, cause now like you're going to enter into this technical world and you're going to think about things from a whole different angle. And if you're a real fan of music, he's like, this is going to shift that. Um, so just be aware of that. Like, just be aware that you're going to listen to things in a whole different light now. So I think it's a hundred percent true, you know? When you did that, were you looking, like, did you go in to start studying that stuff to make a living? Because you're like, man, I don't know, it's hard to make a living as a musician. And this is one way that maybe I can, like, sit down and make a living. Yeah, it was kind of, it, it was an angle for me to 
be like, this can be something I can do mm -hmm. to supplement me being a drummer in a band that hopefully becomes successful and so on and so forth. So it was a way for me, you know, at 18 being like, well, I can't stay here yeah, because I can't, I can't be a drummer in, you know, small town, Wisconsin and be successful, uh, to the extent that I want to be. So I need to get out of here and do something that has some kind of same lane that, you know, that what I'm super uber focused on right now, with, you know, music. And I went on a, a, an actual uh, family trip when I was 17 and I went to New York, upstate New York. And some family friends were like, oh, our son just went to the school for engineering. Uh, and I was like, like a train, like what, what, what are you talking <laughs> about? And he's like, no, like engineering, like making records and, you know, recording records. I was like, oh, interesting. And I'd never, you know, it just never crossed my mind about making the record, but you know, just always just playing and being recorded. Um, so they gave me the info where their son went to school and then told me like, yeah, now he's in Chicago working at a recording studio. I was like, no kidding. Okay. That's an interesting uh, angle, you know? And so. I, you know, I remember coming home from that trip and telling my mom, being like, hey, I think I'm not going to go to college and I think I'm going to try this other school thing out. And and it seems like it's a, you know, it could be a cool thing. And she's like, no, absolutely not. You're not moving to Arizona. And like this, that seems wrong. And meanwhile, my dad was like, yeah, do it. <laughs> like, go get out of the house and go, you know, do something. And then, you know, it turned out to be great. Uh because it just it set me in the right direction but the schooling like aspect of it was hilarious back then you know it like i i moved to arizona in 1994 fall of 1994 and i moved to minneapolis in the february of 1995 that's how long my schooling was uh. <laughs> so it was really it was basically just like hey this is a recording studio this is a tape machine this is a recording console this is a microphone good luck out there but it was, it, you know, it was highly emphasized on like get an internship and go under that route of like studying under somebody, you know, find a mentor or so on and so forth. So, which was like 100% true. I, you know, I learned more in my three month internship than I did at my time in school for sure. And then just, you know, kept progressing there. So who was the, in where did you, who was your mentor? Who did you do the internship with? Was that Chris Blood? No, it wasn't. Uh, Chris, I met shortly thereafter, though, a couple years after that. I had two mentors, um, a guy named Jim May, who owned the recording studio that I wound up buying. Uh, so I, 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 I bought him out uh, back in 2004. Um, so Jim May was the, the, the main guy at this uh, recording studio called Trail Mix. Yeah. Um, and then um, Paul Martinson was my other mentor who uh, was a huge engineer. Um, he worked with Dylan and Leo Kotke and did uh, like blood on the tracks here in uh, Minneapolis. And so he was the guy who had, you know, his nickname was Golden Ears. Like he was the guy who taught me how to place a microphone on something, you know, and he would let, he's the guy who would let me run a session and let me screw up the session and then show me how to fix it. And, you know, I learned a ton from him. Jim, I learned a ton from just in like, you know, this is how you do things fast. This is how you get things done. Um, he also just had a ton of, you know, trust in me. And within a week of me being an intern at that studio, he was like, sit down. You're going to record this band tonight. And, you know, we're going to just go and do it. And so it was just like a lot of like you learn under fire kind of technique. And so those two guys are the, were the, the starting point of my career. And, you know, and, you know, to this day, I still talk with Jim. He's still doing it. Uh, he works for another studio down in Minneapolis. Paul Martinson passed away, you know, a while back, but, uh, yeah, they're like, they were huge for me. Before you started connecting with like the hip hop artists in the twin cities, what were those or the ones that I know about? What were those early sessions like? Did you have hip hop sessions before Atmosphere? Did you record anybody that that I would know about but don't realize that you recorded? Like what were those? What was that time like? No. Yeah, yeah, no, I did. I had I had um I had like you know, a handful of hip hop clients, but nothing like uh nothing that was was on the work ethic of of 
you know, y'all basically. But, you know, I had a couple like people from Chicago for some reason that would come up to Minneapolis and do cut records, probably because they had family up here or something like that. So, I, you know, I got involved in a, in a couple of records that way. But primarily just because of the, the stuff that I was involved in, I was doing, you know, I was in rock bands. So I was doing I was cutting rock records and making tons of that kind of stuff and then doing a lot of folk records because of uh, Paul Martinson, you know, so I, I had these two worlds that I was like fully immersed in. And then every once in a while, this kind of hip hop stuff would get sprinkled in. And I just remember, you know, I, I really loved working on it and I love the feel of it and I, and I love the energy of it in the room you know um and then but it wasn't until uh until actually until i met chris blood is is when uh i started working on more of that kind of stuff because chris was fully immersed in that and uh and it just so happened that he was just like yeah 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 man you know i, I started freelancing at his studio um and you know there were random things here and there where he couldn't do it and he's like yeah you want to run this session i was like yeah great sounds good uh take over and run a session and that's how you came in and that's how atmosphere came in um all that stuff just kind of funneled in because of christopher yeah i think i met chris blood uh when i was doing something with mad son from the unknown prophets i did a i produced one of the tracks on his thing hmm. and then there was some early musab stuff so that's when he was that's when chris had a440 yep and so i went in there that was one of the I think that was the first time that I was actually in a physical studio. Yeah. And I and watching, you know, Madsen rap to the beat that I had made and stuff. That was my first real experience with that. Yeah. And then I think wasn't Atmosphere originally working with Chris Blood? Like, did you yep. like fill in a few of those sessions or like what was what was that connection? I did. So I'm, I'm I, so I think I think Chris had something to do with overcast if i'm not mistaken he might have and i know he was working with like mikey he, um like he was he was working on idea and abilities maybe firstborn even um and so but chris was also uh he had some buddies that ha had a spot down in atlanta um and they were about to make a record and they wanted to bring him down to to make this record and put him up for like a month or something like that but that was right at the same time that uh uh, atmosphere was going to make god loves ugly so christopher was like yeah man um we can still do that like i'll, I'll just put you in touch with joe he can come engineer because i was working out of a440 as a freelance engineer and so i i tracked all that god loves ugly stuff um and by the time we were done tracking then christopher came back into town and i just kind of handed it back to him and i was like cool you know we're good um and i feel like in that time too i had met you and musab because um, I don't remember what we were doing. Like Vitamin was there too and Jake. Um, but I was at that point, I was next door then. Okay. So I had uh, I was I was managing trail mix next door to A440. Yes. Um, and then so I just remember doing a session uh, with you guys. And then Jake was just like, wait, you got Pro Tools next door? And I was like, yeah. And the A440 had eight ads. He's like, why are we in here? Let's go next door and, and work in Pro Tools. I was like, okay, cool. And so we brought that stuff over to my room. And then uh, God Loves Ugly got wrapped up. And I remember this is like in the fall, like November. And then I got a phone call from Sean in like December being like, hey, we're ready to make the next record. <laughs> I was just like, wait, did you even finish this last record? He's like, no. Nah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of, you know, in that Sean way. Um, and and then that's when we made Seven's Travels. So it was like, we literally like made God Loves Ugly and Seven's Travels within a span of like four months or something like that. And some of the songs from Seven's Travels wound up on our and God Loves Ugly and then vice versa. God Loves Ugly songs came over to Seven's Travels. Um, so it just all got like mixed up in there and and kind of kind of did that. And then uh, and that's when we started working over on my side in my room. And then they just we just kind of stayed over there. Yeah, I forgot about so. that time that Vitamin D and Jake won. I think Sadiq had connected with them somehow and brought them to town. And me yeah. and Musab had, I think he was just making that connection. So me and Musab rec recorded yep. a few songs with them. And yeah, and I think that actually started, Musab's album, Respect the Life, I think started because of those sessions. 
Really? And I don't know what happened with the songs that I made with them. Like I, I made, I, made I don't it. either. I bet, I bet they're they're out there somewhere. Probably still on. They're probably somewhere in my Pro Tools rig. You know, it's some somewhere out there. I don't know. Yeah, I do know that that was the <laughs> yeah. first time that I actually rapped into a mic in the studio, and was really. Yeah. Um, I was just really taken with like how different it was to hear yourself in the in the in the headphones clean. You know what I mean? And I found yeah, it like man. hard to. Yeah. I found it hard to breathe and rap on beat and because I'm like hearing myself. It's it, a weird it thing. So strange, man. It's a weird thing. Like that, like that whole, it's like, it's like this weird fishbowl, right? Where, you know, you take a, you're taken out of whatever comfort zone you have, you right. know, be it in, you know, ants basement or whatever it was that, you know, you, you were used to doing stuff. And, and then all of a sudden you're put in this <laughs> glass booth and just like in front of this microphone and you hear every like nose whistle that you have and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, you're just like, oh, this is, you know, this is real. And for some people it's like, it's a, it's a mind bend, you know, and it really was you just gotta me. figure out a way to, yeah. And, and yeah, then, you gotta figure out a way to make it comfortable because also the way that you project your voice isn't, is really different being on like a handheld yeah. mic or like, you know, being in a room full of people and the way that you project your voice and be heard in a room full of other, yep. you know, in a lunchroom where you're trying to get everybody to hear you or, you know, you're in a totally. whack yeah. system at the Red Sea or Bon Appetit or something like that <laughs> and trying to be heard over the music and everything. You you get in a booth and it's entire like that environment does not record, doesn't reward that type of projecting. You end up just sounding mm -hmm. crazy. So you almost have to relearn something that, especially if you've been doing it a long time, it's like learning how to walk again or, yeah, um, you know, learning how to how to swim all over again or something. It's really a trip. Yeah, man. I've had all kinds of situations where, like, you know, I've seen rappers on stage just melting faces, and then they're in the booth, and it's n you're just like, where where was that guy? Like, wh let's get you, let's get that guy in this booth somehow and then you know or hearing their demos and being like why like it's not it's not the same we got to find whatever that spark was that the demo came from i remember like i'd have to bring in like couches into the booth so they could just lay down on the couch or sit down on the couch because like that's where they cut their demo and then like that's where they were comfortable i was like all right great let's bring a couch in let's like get you sitting and seeing what happens you know so it's just trying to find that that motivation to get them to to be that yeah to have that thing that makes it special that you know that you know, puts them in the booth to, to begin with right so just like finding that i mean with you know we started experimenting a little bit with with sean and some of those through slug with some of those tracks where you know i got a five thousand dollar beautiful microphone yeah. and it was like it's too good like you're like nah, i don't want to hear that so at the same time, I got a 58 right next to it, you know, and he can ha he can hold on to it and rap into it, you know, and some songs just were just like, this is better on a handheld mic. This is better because it's better for you and it's better for the song. Yeah. And on uh, some songs like we not we want that that high quality, but other songs like now I'm at the stage now, man, where I'm just like, I don't care, like do it however you want to do it and get it to me however it needs to get it to me and that's what it'll be you know that's what it is and if as long as it's capturing the performance like that's what it is you know so much of being a thinking about that kind of like you know that that weird headspace of being an artist they're like artists are we're really crazy you know what i'm saying and the more <laughs> genuinely artistic somebody is the more sincere they are the more we're bearing our souls the more you know like so often we're drawn to this thing because uh, you know, we have this vision that we want to get out, but also we want validation. Also, we want all this stuff. Yeah. And so, man, one of the things I noticed about you really early on is that one of the roles that you're playing is almost like a therapist. Like you, one of your jobs, not, not only are you making sure that the sound of what's happening in the booth makes it into the box or into the tape, but also you the way that you interact with the artist, a lot of times, not with everybody, but you're also guiding the energy of the artist. Yeah. 
And yeah, yeah. I'm, I've just always really been fascinated with that. And can you talk about what it's like being the person that w who's tasked with getting the right takes out of these really highly sensitive, really quirky people that have all these idiosyncrasies yeah. and, you know, the littlest <laughs> things can send us off, you know, like, uh huh. yeah, uh -huh. I, I think that's one of the main things I want to hear about. No, nah, man, you. it's a, it's a balancing act. It's all, it's all about like, yeah, it's all about striking while the iron is hot. And sometimes it takes a long time for that iron to get hot. Um, and sometimes it's just like, it's instantaneous and you just got to go. Um, but you know, I, over the years I've, I've learned when I got to say something and when I'm not supposed to say anything <laughs> and just let somebody work it out themselves, you know, and let them, let that internal voice just kind of keep chugging along. And you can sometimes see like it's starting to like evolve and you know, more so it's like when it starts to devolve, that's when I try to get in and be like, all right, let's, you know, let's let's take a listen to a take or let's like, let's try it this way or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, like it's just, there are so many and everybody's different. So it's just like, you know, I, and I've been fortunate enough to, to work with this, you know, a lot of repeat clients. So like, it gives me a little bit of an upper hand where I, I know some of these things that are going to, that are going to come out, you know? So I know, know how the angles to play it, but then the new clients where you're just like, all right, what's this? Like, what, what am I getting into? Um, you know, you just have to like, you just got to be on your toes and try to like get a sense of it really quickly of what, how this is going to go. And sometimes you just got to pull the plug, you know, and sometimes you can tell something's not going to happen and, and it, it's like going down the, the wrong direction and you just put a pause on things, you know, and step out and whatever, take a walk, take a drink. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm not as, uh, artistically driven as a lot of my clients, you know, but I understand a lot of how people react and how people deal with, with that environment, my, my environment, you know? Um, and so I think it just gives me the capability of being able to like talk people through this kind of stuff and, you know, figure out the best way to get the end results that we need, you know? Yeah. It, it really seems like the, that balancing act that you said about, keeping people engaged and really reading them. It's one of the things that makes Ant so great at what he does, you know, is that he's able to not just make a beat, but also really get a, a sense and a feeling for the person that he's working with. And so like he's seeing something in the artist that he's trying to bring out. And so he's mm -hmm. talking to us and he's coaching us and he's, you know, uh, you know, doing whatever he can to try to inspire that thing to come out. And you guys together really, uh, I think, created an environment where you work with artists that that's their thing. Like no matter how good we are at rapping yeah. or singing or whatever the thing is, the scene that that Musab and Atmosphere and, and me and you and Ant really developed in the Twin Cities is like you you're really trying to get a sense of who this human being is on a heart level. Mm -hmm. But doing that in a really sterile environment. Weird, sterile environment. Yeah, sterile environment. That's exactly it. Like, I'm still tr I'm trying to capture, like, from a technical side of things, I want to capture this as, you know, as purely as I can so that we can make it, you know, you can hear all the nuance and the essence and everything and all that kind of stuff. Um. You know, and it took me a long time to get over the fact that none of that crap matters. You know, like what matters is like what's coming into the microphone and not how that goes through the microphone and all that kind of stuff. Like, but making sure that the artist in the room, you know, the band in the room, like they're doing their job, you know, and and they're emoting it the, the best they can. And so technicalities aside, you know, leave that kind of stuff out the door. But like, you know, maybe some of the technicality stuff is like, all right, we got to turn the lights down low or whatever, you know, like I got to be on top of that kind of stuff too. Or, 
you know, uh, pl placing a microphone in, in a different position or bringing out a cool looking microphone for somebody to get excited about all of a sudden just be like, yeah, let's try this <laughs> and get into it. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a psychological warfare half the time. And, you know, but other half the time, it's not like people just get in and get some stuff done and it goes really smooth. And you're like, wow, that's, that's great. That, that's let's, let's have another day like that tomorrow. And then it's a whole different story. What are the types of things that you learn about people? Like you're observing them in a really vulnerable place. Like you're observing us. Like I know you've seen me yeah. in really vulnerable states that not everybody has. And I wouldn't trust everybody to do. So, yeah. you know, what's it like to see these people, especially, you know, somebody that, that sees one of us on stage, you know what I'm saying? You see like you know, Dessa or somebody on stage and you're like, she owns the room. Sean is owning the room. Yeah. Ali is everybody saying what he's telling him to say. Yeah. But you see us from a really different perspective. What, ha what have you learned about people from watching them try to create their art? Um, I mean, you know, I, I, in general, you know, everybody, I feel like everybody's got something that they want to say they've got the message that they want to get across um you know and there's a lot of different ways that it can happen and there's a lot of different emotions that can come into play um and you just have to you know you just have to f try to roll with that and there's been times man like where I, I, me as a it just as an engineer part of it i'm i am not in the same place you know like I am in a different mindset altogether <laughs> and somebody's like pouring out like, you know, the deepest things and I just, have, you know, whatever. Or like, uh, you know, I'm in a dark place and somebody's like doing the funniest thing ever. And I'm just like, I, I can't be on the same wavelength here. So I try to be as much in the moment as I can, as it allow me to, to like try to get on the same page as whatever is happening so that I can make sure that I'm doing my best to help it come across the speakers that way. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, you know, it's a trip to, to work on, like I have worked on some seriously challenging songs, you know, just like tough, tough songs, you know, and tough emotionally you walk out of those sessions emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally. And you walk out of that and I'm not the one who's, you know, I'm, I'm just the one who's like capturing it, but I walk out of those sessions just completely drained as well. You know, and just like, whoo, you know, like, like it's, it's a, it, it's a roller coaster. And so I don't know. I don't know. Like, I just, you know, I just try to ride the waves, you know, and I feel like I'm pretty good at getting in whatever zone that generally is for the most part. You know, but there's times where there's, these things don't align. And, you know, at that point, I just have to kind of like tunnel vision and and focus on what needs to get done. And hopefully I get across the finish line at the same time as everybody else. But it's it's. um, Yeah, I don't know. It's it. I, I would say that's some of the more challenging things uh, in the recording aspect of things anyways, is to. You know, I is to put myself in somebody's shoes in that scenario um and try to try to make sure that that comes comes across more often than not my job in that is a little bit easier because usually hopefully the music has already set up that mood and that background and the lyrics are like driving it home and you know and then it's just my job to <laughs> make sure that emotion still comes through the speakers mentioned at the top of the podcast that Syria and Turkey have been devastated by this series of historically catastrophic earthquakes. And if you listen to the podcast, you know that my family and I have been living in Istanbul for the past couple of years. 
my inboxes and my texts and my apps that I use to communicate with people and my DMs and my email, everything has just been full of messages of people reaching out, making sure we're okay, asking if we need anything. And alhamdulillah, I mean, physically and directly, the earthquakes didn't touch Istanbul. Some people said they felt tremors and things. We personally didn't feel them. But just living in this country, I mean, first of all, there's already a big economic crisis that this country has been undergoing for the past several years. On top of that, the weather is extremely cold for this region of the world, and they're just not set up for it. So really low temperatures that honestly, coming from Minnesota, like temperature wise, like, man, why does this feel so harsh? Like I said, this part of the world just isn't set up for it. So a lot of rain, uh, the buildings aren't set up for this type of cold. They're just not insulated like that. So even nice places have water coming in and they're really drafty. People have lost power. There's electrical storms. There's incredible winds. This country has been already dealing with a lot not to mention what Syria is going through. And so the earthquakes, it rivals September 11th. And the feeling of being in a country that has gone through something like this, in some ways reminds me of September 11th. It's a historical level event. And I remember when the earthquakes happened in Haiti and there were hurricanes and things like that. And being in America and just being like, man, I see the footage and I want to help. And what do we do? And I just remember feeling like, man, I really hope that we can trust these organizations. I know our intentions are good, but in this particular case, it means a lot to us that we've been connected with Zakat Foundation from the beginning of this podcast, because Zakat Foundation works on the ground. They don't just drop money places. They don't just drop ship food. They have a really serious headquarters in Turkey, and the president of the organization is from Turkey. So if you go to zakat.org, Z-A-K-A-T dot org, this is an organization that's deeply connected. This is an organization that you can trust. This is an organization that's really adept at getting goods and services and resources exactly where they're needed and to the people who need them the most quickly. If you feel moved to help, a little bit goes a long way. You know, the the $20 that we can give, the $100, the $200, the $5, it goes a long way, especially if a lot of people do it. So I'm personally asking, out of all the talking I've been doing for the last, coming up on a year about Zakat Foundation, I'm personally asking, go to zakat.org right now and give something to the people in Turkey and Syria that are going through this. And while you're there, stick around with Zakat Foundation because... It's a reputable organization that does great work all over the world. When we see the greats do it, there's this weird expectation that we want to be like that. So I've helped a lot of people convert to Islam. And when people see the movie or read the autobiography of Malcolm X, they see this story of this person who, you know, even if there's some legend involved with it, this person who went from completely like being a hustler and being like the roughest cat in the prison to being the most saintly, perfect Muslim seemingly overnight. Mm. And so there's people that are like, mm. well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not doing this right. I'm not qualified. I'm not capable. And it's like, man, you're watching literally the legend of our time. You know what I'm saying? That's not, don't, don't compare right. yourself to that. Yeah. And for me, when we started hearing that Jay-Z was like walking in the booth after writing these things in his head and walking in and doing it in one take, <laughs> like, man, it really bothered me. When I wrecked a lot of people, man. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering specifically you know? about that. <laughs> well, yeah. I, hmm. I mean, I, you know, Jay-Z is on a pedestal. Let's So that's like, that's unfair in and of itself, right? Like that dude... He's pretty untouchable. Um, so, yeah, the, I don't know. I have, I've never. I, it's very rare that I've seen anybody do be able to do that. I I, I did get to uh, work with Black Thought, and I saw him sit on the couch for ten minutes, and then go in the booth and just bang something out. And I just remember turning around, just being like, "That was amazing." <laughs> like, yeah, that was BK One's record. So there, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm just like that. You know, that'll forever be like etched in my brain of like that just happened but that's a 
that's a rarity, man. You know, uh, I think I I don't know how people how people do that. You know, but I'm you know again I'm not I'm not a writer I'm not an artist in that way. So like, when you see something like that, it's like how how's that even humanly possible? Yeah. And why, how, what is, how is somebody capable of that? I mean, Jay-Z just recently delivered like one of his most amazing long verses with just like the double and triple entendres in this thing. It's incredible. And it's on a DJ Khaled record. Yeah. It takes you forever to unpack it. Like too, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, Kendrick is another one like that where I'm just like you, it takes forever to just like to digest something like that. And then, you know. You'd be listening to that thing for years and still be like, oh, oh, oh yes. And yes. so Guru, there's a video on his Instagram where he shows you the Pro Tools session because he's like, people don't believe me. And it is mm. one take of Jay-Z delivering mm-hmm. this verse. And he's like, and this was the first take. He's like, I don't know how to prove that part to you unless we like go into the like, right. you know, session data. But like, Literally, yeah. this man walked in here and just delivered this and walked away. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Really yeah. incredible, man. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, that's, that's like a, that's a magic talent. So, you know, is, is Black Thought pro- the most legendary one that you recorded, you think? Um, I, yeah, probably. I mean, I've had Snoop in a couple times too, and that's, that's been, amazing and he's just like he's snoop man like you know he gets in the booth and he he, there's not much thinking on his part either like you know he just goes and does his thing and it adds all his little oh yes and then you know all his snoopisms and it's it's just like there's another one i was like yeah that's that's what i've been listening to for years you know like it's amazing um but yeah you know those two guys uh are obviously on on in, in that vein of popularity you know um so the initial the initial artist i mean i think atmosphere was the first one that really decided like joe mabbit is the guy that does our records and so you were with slug and really with ant like i really saw the the relationship between you and ant and so many great artists have that like they have people that they have their these musical marriages that are really important because of how safe and creative and connected they become, you know, that so many great artists that we know have uh, a particular engineer that records them. Like you mentioned Kendrick and everybody knows that Ali is the one that mixes and records and engineers Kendrick stuff. Uh, Drake has yep. 40 uh, you know, on down the line. And there are a lot of them that we don't, we don't end up knowing mm-hmm. their names. Like it's just become a later thing that we start to know their names. Yeah. But I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between you and Ant and the way that you, you know, Ant was bringing in these like really rough, especially early on. He made those things on a, on a, you know, on an ASR 10 computer uh, sampler from 1995 with home speaker yeah. stereo speakers, like not studio monitors. Like he was listening to this stuff in headphones or listening to it and recording it on four track tapes and then bringing that stuff into you. And you guys over the next period of like 10 years really developed the sound that ended up being the Rhyme Sayer sound. And in a lot of ways, the the Minnesota the Twin Cities underground independent hip hop sound. So I wonder if you could just talk mm-hmm. first of all about Ant, and because <laughs> it's you, oh, just man. if you could talk to us about the Ant, man. yeah, man, just anything that comes to mind about him. I mean, you know, who? Oh, long time. So you know, Ant and I have been working together forever. Um, I, you know, (laughs) I, I think, uh, I think the dude is, is, is kind of a genius. Uh, he's got this sense about him in that, you know, he, he views music in a way, 
you know, he's not, he's not really a musician himself, uh, much, you know, like it's so like dealing with him on that level of like, uh, of dealing with musicians and things like that. And, and the way he talks to people, I was just like, this is a, this is a whole thing. Like th this guy thinks about music in a, a whole different way than I think about music. And I need to, you know, I need to figure that out. I need to figure out how to talk to him about music and, and that kind of stuff. And that just came naturally after working together on so many different projects and working on so many different things, but his feel and his sense of things. And, you know, he knows what he wants. Sometimes it takes us a little while to get there. Sometimes it happens real quick, but he, you know, it's just the thing where, you know, I like the, anytime, like a new uh, song that he brings in or gets presented. I, I spent nowadays, the way we work nowadays, a lot of times my role uh, is purely just mixing at this stage. Um, and then adding embellishment stuff, you know, at, at adding drums or 808s or things like that. Um, but so now my role in, in making records with him is me hitting play and hearing his music kind of already put together. And just like that initial, like, three seconds of listening to a song of his and just knowing exactly what it's going to be and, and, and knowing exactly how it's going to go. Um, and then over the past 20 years to see how that's changed, you know, and see how he keeps changing up the way he does things. And then all of a sudden the next thing he brings in, I'm just like, wait a minute, what is this now? You know, but still having that like initial reaction of like, yeah, I get this. They, yep. I see where this is going immediately. You know, at first when we, you know, when I first started with him on, uh, God loves ugly, I was completely confused by all of it, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, very quickly kind of started to get, understand what, what they were, what they were doing and, you know, kind of their work ethic and, and his like vision on things yeah. and, and how he's, you know, he thinks about like, you know, the, the way he thinks about albums and like full projects, you know, and, um, and how everything works together. It like, I feel like I learned a lot from him and I like, it's the way I think about things. And I think that he's a big part of that, you know, like it's still, I still have that like kind of mentality of like, what's the whole scope of this whole record? What's, you know, not what's the song, but what's the record and what's the whole thing. Um, those guys are, they just are unstoppable. Um, I'm working on a record for them right now. That is for the, it's the next record that comes out that the record that hasn't even come out yet. You know what I mean? Like we're two records, three records ahead at all time on stuff. And it's just like, and it's, it just keeps going and he just keeps making stuff and he keeps changing it up. And it, it, it to see him, think about like how do i take it to the next stage you know how do i keep doing what i'm doing but keep making it interesting and keep you know keep chugging forward with stuff and seeing those different evolutions of yeah asr 10 sampler like i found this i found this thing i chopped it up i put some drums over it it made the snare super loud uh and that's it now somebody's gonna rap on it right and then going from that to how do we add more sounds how do we yeah. make it you know more, how do we make it have more depth yeah. and you know having him having him come in and be like how do we do this like this is what i have now let's take it to this next level and, and us just having conversations about like well we can try this we can do that whatever like put a delay on the snare you know <laughs> like let's let's make it wider or whatever and then to then bringing in musicians you know and like to completely re replay the samples and completely yeah completely start over and so be like this is the sample now let's redo it our way, you know, and, and, and rework it. And at first it was like, I want this to be exactly like the mm -hmm. sample. So Joe, figure this out, like make this, like, who do we, you know, who's the string section we can call or who's the, I, we need horn players for this or a bass player or whatever. Yeah. And so th at that point, like, that's when, like, that's when I really started getting on his same wavelength. Cause then I started figuring out like how this dude thinks a little bit even beyond just the 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 sample right and so bringing in musicians and working things out and just like 
you know, intensely listening to things and recreating these samples and, you know, learning on it together uh, and figuring things out and bringing in the right musicians and sometimes the wrong musicians and then having to bring in new musicians or whatever. Um, but it was, you know, it's through that process. And then, uh, and then eventually just now he's kind of back to doing more sample related stuff and then sampler related stuff and still incorporating live playing and musicians. And so it's just been this, like this, you know, organic evolution and to be involved with him in this process has been amazing. There was a time where, you know, like he went out to the Bay area and started working with G Coop, who's just amazing. Yeah. Um, and then started bringing tracks back for that and just to be involved in that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, uh, to get back into that, you know, like you could tell that that like opened up this whole new thing for him, you know, like this idea of like, I've been working with samples forever. What if I just want to take the guitar line and work on the guitar line for something and do that. So, to see the, you know, the evolution of Ant be around the evolution of Ant has been, you know, he's one of the best. Having him trust me to be involved in his process has been amazing, you know. Yeah, it's crazy how many different sounds they've been able to pull off. Yeah. You know what I mean? But with always with the same very clear foundation, like the skeleton is is always goes back to the ASR-10. It's like, you know, yep. drums that are really heavy you know like the the drums are always going to be ants 1980s you know i'm staying stetsasonic yep. and you know whether it's a you know 808 sounds or sample drum sounds it's always going to go back to those like first 10 years of hip-hop for him yeah and then some sort of you know sample structure around that that he in particular has been able to go so many different directions with it and make hip hop music that doesn't sound like when I think just think about you coming in on on God Loves Ugly as one of your first hip hop projects, uh -huh. and I think about the music that's on that record, Los Angeles, Hot and Bothered. It's a sample of some people going glug 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 glug. <laughs> like what the hell is going on? You know what I mean? Um, you know what I'm saying? There's like I remember, yeah. I remember um, it, was, it was shrapnel, and we had um, the we had Monque come in and do some stuff like vocally over the yeah. top of it, and I was like, I did not, you know, again, I was not very embedded in this stuff, and I was just like, and she's in there just making all the weird noises, and so in in my mind, I'm like, man, this is some this is some Bjork kind of stuff. And I remember saying that to Sean and Sean was just like, what are you talking about? I was just like, I have no point of reference here, man. I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm listening to. Like this stuff is weird, man. Like y'all are making a weird record right now. And like, you know, or a weird song and you're making it weirder and it's amazing. And like, so when I think of weird, like my mind went to like Bjork, <laughs> I'm just like, that was weird to me, you know, like this is, this is, this was my parallel. And he was just like, oh, okay. All right. I, all right. Okay. But yeah, man, like just that dude will make, he'll make music out of anything, you know, and, 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 and it works again. It, it kind of goes back to what I was saying. Like that first three seconds when I, nowadays, when I hit play and hear whatever it is, he's like, I hear, I hear 20 years ago, but I also hear right now and ant, doing this new thing that ant is doing you know yeah. what i mean like all in this weird three seconds of hit and play on his this next track that i'm going to mix for him or whatever you know what i mean um so it's like this familiarity and this this like this like like yes i i have traveled this 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 path many a time slash what's this sound that i'm hearing right now you know like it's it's great yeah, man. You know, one of the things that I think early on, like with those unique sounds, is just there, there was never a hip hop song that sounded like so many atmosphere songs before they mm. did it. Like, there, you know, they just, it didn't exist. Like, you talk about Shrapnel and yeah. they had other things like that before, but that's, I think, where they really started digging into it and they finally had the opportunity for the world to, or at least the part of the world that knew about them to hear that stuff. But what's mm -hmm. so interesting to me about atmosphere in general, and uh, I, th I think you had a role in this, 
is just that these are guys that come from Minnesota and you know their their dads are black, their moms are white, they're also native and they have all these different you know it's it's very thoroughly hip hop music. Like I said you got somebody chopping up drums, chopping up samples, he's rapping on it. There's no question about the the hip hop aesthetic. But there's also something else there. There's like a certain sensibility that I think is rock related and it's in the drums. Mm. Like it's in the way that mm. the drums sound and the presence that the drums have in the track. There's something about the way they move as well, but the focus mm -hmm. on the snare, the focus on the crispness of it, you know what I mean? That I, that I think has to be related yeah. to you in some way being coming from that background of being a rock drummer. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I mean, Ant snares always crack with or without me. <laughs> but but I definitely, you know, everything I approach is, you know, it starts with the drums. And, you know, that's just my, that's embedded in my DNA. So that's just like, that's my familiar spot. That's the rhythm of everything. That's like, that's where I start. So, um you know, and nine times out of 10, that's the driving force of things. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I want that stuff to be focal, you know, and, and be the focus of things. And then you get the vocals on top of that. And, you know, Sean likes to have his words hit right with the snare, disappear with the snare sometimes. So it's just like, they're on even playing fields. And I like that, you know, I like, I like not having the vocals be like so out front that it's just all vocal centric and you know i like it to be this kind of one unit in that kind of in that kind of regard and lets us push it like that and lets me lets me layer all that stuff in there and and drive it that hard and it's great sometimes you know more often than i was like yeah drive it harder <laughs> yeah, push it further you know, more snare more kick which i'm all for you know so so I know that initially, you know, you said you had some other hip hop stuff, but like really you became like Atmosphere's go-to and then everyone that Ant worked with. So, you know, you did my records. When we did Shadows on the Sun, that was, like I said, I've been in the studio that one time recording a song. Mm -hmm. But when we did Shadows on the Sun, like that was my first time rapping in a studio really. And yeah. I feel like, I, I remember I was working a job at that time and I took one five day week off of work and we came in and recorded half the album and then I went back and wrote some more songs and made some more things. I feel like we came back like two months later and I did the other half of the album. I was sick, like, but it was like my one week off of work. <laughs> so I was like, I had a cold yeah. and I just took a bunch of Sudafed and Robitussin and like, I can hear it on the, on the Shadows on the Sun album. Like you, I can hear the songs because my vocal performance improved, but I was also really nasally on the second half of the record that we did. Right. And then I think I took another couple of days off and we mixed the record, but we made that whole record in maybe 12 or 15 studio sessions. Yeah. And so I started doing those and then, you know, and then the Musab record, you did that one, yep. Uh, and Ant had a big role in that one, and then Shaka's album, Self Destruction, had a big role in that. At what point did that catch on, and you know the the Doom Tree people started working with you, and you know, and so what did that look like when you when you started having that? Because you became like the go to person for the for the hip hop yeah. scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like. Um... I don't, I'm, I'm not exactly, it's, it's, there's so many things overlap in that time period, you know, like, um, cause I feel like if somebody was out on tour, then I was working with somebody else, you know, like, and then somebody come back from tour, I'd work with them and so the next person would go out on tour. So I, I don't remember the timeline very well. Cause it's all a blur. Cause I was also like playing in rock bands and that whole area of life was fuzzy um but I, I i remember at some point in time like uh high respects hit me up um because they i think it was shortly after like seven's travels or something like that and so they came in to tour, tour the studio 
and they were like we heard you're working on hip-hop records i was like yeah i've done a couple you know in the last couple years all of a sudden like i'm i'm working on a lot of them they're like cool we'll, we'll you know we'll cut this record with you and then from that like it just steamrolled and and then uh steph um pos he did his first record with me um and then from him came all the Dr- doom tree crew and so we're talking about uh dessa sims all, all the stuff laser did laser beak did all yep, stuff. sims okay. laser beak and all yeah all all that stuff and then laser beak was also in a in a rock band plastic constellation so i was doing their records too because i was still in the rock scene and doing rock records you know so it's like it just became this like this like rotating door of hip hop kids and rock kids that were all kind of in the same thing in this, you know, doing the same, my band, even at one point in time, I I don't remember what record was for, but Sean, you know, atmosphere did like seven shows at the seventh street. Um, and you know, my band at the time opened for one of those nights, you know, it was just like, and I, you know, there were whatever, 10 other acts that were coming in and out of the studio at that time, like doing that kind of stuff. So, it just all, it just kind of all steamrolled because it, it feel I felt like it just a fire got lit and all of a sudden when atmosphere started kind of like really moving things along, and then y'all started like, you know, making moves and and building on this thing, it just got everybody excited and everybody started doing stuff and and it just kind of that that path led to me eventually you know just like oh that's that he's the guy who made that record let's go talk to him about it and so i know Laserbeak did lizzo's first album did you work on that first lizzo album i didn't no i don't remember what i was doing at the time but they were working um with ryan um who was in a band uh digitata and what the heck else was he polisa he had something to do with polisa yeah yeah polisa yeah he's polisa's uh producer so they were um he had just made friends with uh this engineer producer bj burton who's super talented um and so bj burton was basically living with ryan for free and doing all of ryan's like grunt work and like all these little projects and stuff so they they actually that lizzo stuff all got done in ryan's apartment um and so but they took all the beats that beak and i did beak made the beats i mixed the beats and then they took all that stuff gave it to lizzo and she just did her thing over the top of them and then put that Lizzo, what it, Lizzo bangers out or whatever it was called. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting thing. She wound up coming in a couple times. She was actually, um, uh, when she first moved to town, she was in a project called, uh, Lizzo and the Larva Inc. So they did some stuff at our studio, finished up a record that they were working on. And then she came in on one of, POS's records to cut vocals for him on one of his things. So I did have the opportunity to work with her a couple of times. So man, pre, uh, you know, megastar Lizzo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still had the meg- megastar, uh, vibe for sure. Pretty funny. Yeah. It's a Yeah. She definitely always had the, <laughs> the feeling of like, hello everyone. I am a celebrity. <laughs> yes he was like wait what's your name again i am lizzo <laughs> yeah yeah really dope man you will know my exactly, name exactly man. Yeah, man crazy it was just like a ton of records got done during that time because you know then the all those doom tree kids started like everybody was making records for them so that that was like five people in that squad plus you know producers and stuff so at any given moment i was working on somebody's record in that year during a year or whatever and then it was like, I think by the time I did felt the felt record felt two, that's when I, that's when me being a musician finally like just stopped mm. because I was just like, you know, I, I had turned down a tour to stay home to do that record. And so the pendulum had kind of finally swung that way. And I'm glad I did. Cause that record was super fun to work on. Um, and that I feel like also that record for some reason was what started making people notice like you did that record that one like there's a vibe to that record that you know that's different too so I was just like yeah it's it's great (laughs) so you know and so staying home for that and doing that spawned a whole bunch more stuff you know outside of the rhyme stuff yeah 
Is there, I mean, you've, you've worked on so many things over the years. Is there a particular album that you hold in special, in special regard? Um, yeah, us, mm. to be honest with you, man, um, that record, making that record, um, was really, it was a challenge. It was really fun. Um, but I felt like that was the record that Ant and I really clicked on and figured some things out on and, um, and made some really beautiful decisions on that mm -hmm. record. And I think you brought a lot to that record. Um, you know, lyricism, uh, is spectacular and, and beautiful. So I, I feel like that record to me is still like is is on the top of things um i i really love the the record that i did um with atmosphere that was their free one that they gave away it's the smiley face looking one i don't even know what they call it strictly um, leakage strictly leakage that i just remember having a lot of fun doing mm. that record because it seemed like nobody cared about anything and just wanted to make a record to to goof off and that it, that felt really good to do you know what i mean like so i don't remember any of the particulars about that record um in that time i did that record while when my studio moved for like two years and so that whole time period i was over That's in right. st paul for like a weird two years span yeah 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 and so that whole time period is kind of a weird blur of things um but I just remember in that two years, I think I probably made, I know I made four EPs and maybe two full length records with atmosphere in that spot. Um, it's just a lot of music. Yeah. Cause I, I think you guys finished. Can't imagine how much fun we're having there. I know you made when life gives you lemons there. We finished undisputed yep. truth yep. there. We did most of undisputed truth at, at the, at the yep. northeast spot but we finished it there yeah um and then all those yep. eps the one with sunshine on it and like the sad clown bad yeah. summer winter fall all of those yep. man yeah, yeah. when i think all about that. and then that free album when i think about how much music how much amazing music atmosphere and ant made in that two-year period while they were on yeah. tour like they were touring yeah like crazy at that time as well it's it's really incredible mm -hmm. you know so you, you've worked with so many people and you've seen so many people like up close and in this really intimate way um what do you see that separates the ones that that go further you know what i mean They're, we're all talented all of us are crazy all of us are amazing Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. something special about those two in particular <laughs> that, you know what I mean? That, that, that anybody that's around yeah. them that's honest knows if, if you could try to put a finger on what that is, what do you see? I can't, man. I don't know. I know, I know for one thing, it's like the, the work ethic is like I've, I haven't witnessed with anybody else. Like nobody else produces as much uh, stuff as them. And I like, I feel like, I feel like there's an excitement to them every time they're making something, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, there's, yeah, there's just this work ethic that those two dudes have that I, it, it kind of blows my mind. Um, and it's not, the same old same old every time either um i can tell that they're having fun like figuring out new ways to do new things and sometimes it just be really dumb and stupid with things you know and just have a really fun time and see where it gets them and then half the time it gets them into something really weird and then they run with it and they're like cool this is our next record idea and we'll just go with it um so yeah, man, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Sean is a very charismatic person, so that can't hurt you, right? And Ant just always moving forward and always making music. I don't know, man. 
I don't know what makes anybody be able to do anything in this industry anymore. It's hard to... It's hard to wrap my head around it. Because it's changed so much. There's just it's so many new angles to approach it at. They just do what they know how to do, and they do it with consistency that makes it work. The Traveler's Podcast is sponsored this week by BetterHelp online therapy platform. And when you use our link to sign up with them, which is betterhelp.com slash travelers, you're going to get a discount on your first month of therapy. We're going to get a commission to help the work that we do here on the podcast. It really is a win-win for everybody. I'm a musician and I cannot stand to watch movies about music being made because it's just like, man, that's not how it works. And I want people to know how it works. My wife is a therapist and she can't stand to watch therapy in TV and movies because she's like, that's not how it happens. On TV and in movies, you see a person lay down on a couch, they cry to a stranger, and that person tells them all the secrets of their life and unlocks everything for them and tells them what to do and maybe gives them pills and things like that. There are a lot of approaches to therapy and there are a lot of ways that it's done. I don't think any of them are that. What therapy does look like in most cases is we start talking to people about the issues that are bringing us to therapy in the moment. So addictions or relationship issues or anxiety or depression or thoughts that we're wrestling with. And firstly, they ask us questions that we couldn't have asked ourselves. And those questions are very revealing. Then they listen and repeat our answers back to us in ways that offer us a lot to learn a lot about ourselves. Now, mind you, they haven't told us anything yet, but as time goes on, they start drawing connections and they just give us the opportunity to look at ourselves and our lives and the things that we're dealing with and the way that we've processed things, the way that we've stored information in ways that we haven't explored. Like, what's the idea that I have of myself based on this thing that happened? And maybe I didn't even realize that I translated it that way. And then what conclusions have I drawn about the world that may have served me in the moment, but may not be working as I go forward? So therapy takes a lot of different forms. There are a lot of different approaches, but most great therapists are going to unlock different ways for us to see ourselves that are going to allow us to come to our own conclusions and to set our own goals. And I personally believe that we deserve access to therapy. I had a hard time accessing therapy. I heard about BetterHelp on a podcast, and I gave it a shot. I've had two different therapists now, and I'm actively involved in weekly therapy sessions on BetterHelp. So go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash travelers. Like I said, you get that discount. You start talking to them about what type of therapist you'd like to see, and then you make your own schedule with that therapist. You can start communicating with them right away. And at any time, if you feel like maybe this isn't the person for me, you change therapist, no questions asked, no extra charge. I'm recommending it. I have this partnership with them. So go to betterhelp.com slash travelers and get down with this therapy journey. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to jump back in in one moment, but I just want to take a second and say that I'm very grateful that you're here because... The podcast and the music that we release, the limited vinyl drops and the merchandise and the learning series, the events, the concerts, all the stuff that we do is completely independent. There's no record label. There's no distributor. There's no big corporation behind it. But I'm very grateful that we're able to make a living doing exactly what we want to do. It comes from our heart and it's intended to go to your heart and nowhere else. And that's a really beautiful thing to be able to say especially in this particular time. And I think you know that already, and I think you know this already, but my guess is that you also follow and listen to and support other artists and creatives and content people and speakers and thought leaders that are independent. And when that's the case, it's cool to follow us on social media, but it's actually not that cool to just follow us on social media. It's getting more and more corny. 
um, increasingly that things are changing in ways that I don't have time to get into right now. But it means that even if you follow us and even if you tell the robots and the AI and the algorithm and whatever, even if you tell them you want to see the stuff we put out, a lot of the things that we post are just not going to reach your eyes and you're not even going to know about what we're doing. The best way to connect with us is to go to brotherali.com. You'll immediately be prompted to sign our mailing list. And I don't like to sign mailing lists. I don't like giving people my email. But in this case, when you do it, I write those emails personally. And I only send them out when I've got things that I really want to share with you that I think you're interested in. I don't do it a lot. I will not blow up your email. So sign that mailing list. And then go to the shopping section. We got all of our merch there, podcast merch. There's Uncle Sam goddamn anniversary stuff. There's Brother Minister stuff. When we do our limited cassettes and vinyl and all that kind of, all of that is there. You'll be able to see all of that. And if you go to the section called Join, we've got a caravan, which is our group of subscribers and supporters. And there's different ways to interact there. You get exclusive stuff. The top tier of those subscribers, we interact with them a lot. Uh, there's a Slack channel that's open at all times and we communicate and build community. That middle uh, tier, that's $25 a month, you get exclusive stuff. You get parts of these episodes that aren't released to everybody. Uh, you get music and things that I want to share uh, on a regular basis. And then even that, that lower level, that $5 level, you everybody that subscribe, you get these episodes early and without commercials and ads, and you know that you're supporting the work that we're doing here. So if you're digging any of the stuff that we do, head to brotherali.com, connect with us directly, and know that we love you beyond words. We appreciate you beyond words. When we had our time when we were like really introduced to the world in a bigger way, there was a lot of like excitement around that in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, did you have moments of like, oh man, this thing that we're doing together is being celebrated, it's being received, it's being accepted. You know, did you have moments of seeing atmosphere on TV or big sold out shows or stuff like that? I, for me, anytime I go see them here, you know, you know, we go it's First Avenue for the first however many years, you know, and it's always First Avenue is amazing. It's always fun to go see a sold out show at First Ave. And when it's people, you know, that's 100 percent better. But for me, I was just always like I'm surrounded by people in my community that I work with and that enjoy this kind of stuff. And it's amazing. But really, it wasn't until like. Like I went to, uh, you know, New York or California and happened to time it so that they were out there for whatever, like some festival in Cali or some show that they did at the Bowery Ballroom or something like that in New York, where I really like was just like, yo, <sighs> this is, I remember even saying it to him after they got home, just being like, that was something different. Like that was, you know, that wasn't a room full of your peers and people that like are your family and your community. That was like, that was a room full of fans, man. And that was amazing. Or like, you know, getting to see you guys perform at Red Rocks is that's mind blowing. Yeah. That's that, you know, one of the most beautiful venues in the world. And to experience that, like this thing that you're so deeply embedded in and remove yourself from it in that like normal situation that you're in, in your own community and see it, and see 8,000 other people like enjoying it on a level that like it makes me appreciate it on a whole different new line. You know, I'm just like, holy cow, you know, I'm sick of all these songs because <laughs> I've heard them 3,000 times right. each. But man, this is amazing. You know, like this is unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's exciting to see anybody on TV. So anytime I got to see them on like Jimmy Kimmel or uh, Conan, what you know, seeing you on Conan, but you know that it's like you root, man. You're you're rooting for your team because that's so exciting and it's so fun, and it feels great to be involved in that and and have you know a small sliver of connection to some of these things. You know, it's just like it's amazing. But 
being involved in it in the community here is is awesome and it's special. But yeah, I think where I really realized that there was something amazing going on was getting out of here and seeing it, seeing how it's received outside of this. This was spectacular. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, like, man, I've got two older kids and two younger kids and my older kids grew up with me in Minneapolis in that time period. And that was a big part of our family's just reality. And I think it's even part of their identity. And now I got these two little ones and we live in a place where like, I don't even speak the language. I'm just some crazy foreigner who, yeah. you know what <laughs> yeah. I'm saying? Like, like people are just like, oh my God, this guy again, he doesn't even know how to, whatever. Um, and I think to myself, like, man, will will my little kids even realize like what I used to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even know. Like, they, to, to to them, I'm just I'm just their dad. You know what I mean? Which is great. But yeah. I, I wonder, yeah. do your children do your children have a sense of what you're a part of? So, um, yes and no. They. Um, I don't think they they understand the 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 broadness of some of this stuff. Um, so you know, I'm uh, I through our kids' school, we get to see what they what they search for on the internet on their iPads, and uh, uh -oh. so every week we get like the weekly man, report. I, would, I don't know. And there if was I'd one time they that. they no man no 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 it, I you know it's it's you know they, it's there's a lot of like. Uh, how do you dance like this and whatnot <laughs> and like looking up look, looking up different dogs but there was one time where it was uh, my middle child googled Joe Mabbit <clears throat> and I just uh, I took a screenshot of that and sent it to a couple of the uh, my dad friends in the neighborhood I was like it's over like I'm she's either plotting against me or you know and then um, you know I got a I got a photo of me and Snoop and they go up to that photo with their iPads and take pictures of that photo and then take it to school and be like, my dad knows Snoop. And, you know, some of the kids are just like, what? But they play it from an angle of like, my dad's famous. And and then I I have them come home and be like, I am not famous. <laughs> like, this is not how this works. Like, I am the, you know, that's not, that's not who, that's not what I do. Um like I, you know, I've worked with some famous people, but I am not famous. Um, but they, you know, they they understand that like I'm involved in this thing that's that goes beyond our little reach here of the cities, and that people like listen to music that Dad does. And it's also funny that you know if there's a good song on the radio, then they'll ask, "Daddy, did you do this song?" I'm just like, "I'm sorry, I I didn't work with Taylor. I did not." I, Maybe next year, like I'll get around to that. Um, but they, you know, I I bring them into the studio as much as I can and and let them play and let them sing and do all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, they the it's not a it, they don't fully fully grasp what's going on. You know, have you ever tried to network and kind of like you know we're in the Twin Cities we're like this little kind of tucked away thing that we're not really in the music industry right some of the stuff we do is known to the music industry but we're not really part of it and um, I'm just curious to know if you've ever had that ambition to to spread your wings outside and have you ever made that attempt um sometimes sometimes I I you know I find myself going like okay I gotta I got to figure out what's what's beyond this what's the next phase of what it is I'm doing. And it usually some of that stuff just gets spawned from boredom. Like if I, you know, if if I ha if I haven't challenged myself enough or or done something, done a record in a while that I'm like, "Oh man, I can't get enough of this," right? Um so I feel like it's like every seven years or something like that, I get that itch of like, maybe I should get a manager, mm. you know, like maybe I should find somebody to book me more gigs. Do you watch Pensado's place? I have place? that thought. And then you watch Pensado's place. Like, man, I, some, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. But at the same time, like that, 
arena doesn't do a lot for me. Like I, I'm, you know, if I really wanted to, you know, be on that level, I would have moved to LA, you know, a long time ago. And I would have got caught up in that machine. Um, but in all honesty, it doesn't, that doesn't excite me all that much. Like I really, you know, I've been doing this for man, 27 years and it's been organic and I've made a living at it and I've done some really amazing things and I've made some records that I'm super, super proud of and some records that I'm not. <laughs> and it's all part of the process. And at the end of the day, the only person I have to, to answer to is me, you know, like I don't have to like, I, d I just, it's just all me. Like, so if I feel like I'm not doing enough, then that's on me. And then I go and, you know, pick up the phone and call somebody if I have to, but I'm not trying to like have somebody represent me or anything like that. Like, and you know, believe me, I've thought about it. And then for a little while there, I was going out to New York on a regular mm. basis and, and then I would see how that, how things ran out there. And I was just like, oh, this is like a whole different vibe. It's a whole different feel. Yeah, man. Um, and I don't think I'm there for that. You know what I mean? I don't want, I don't want that. And, and, you know, and I've had a bunch of, uh, students and friends and acquaintances move to LA and some of them are just killing it and doing exactly what they want to do. And, you know, and making good records with good people and a bunch of them have moved back because it's not their thing, you know? And I feel like I'd be that guy. I'd be the guy like go out there and do it for a while and be like, yeah, no, I like, it's not, it's not for me. I just have always just wanted to be my own thing and my own entity and just kind of do this again organically is just like how I've always approached it. And, you know, who's to say maybe there's like a day where there's a manager that can get me a record that I would have never even thought about getting and that would be awesome. But then at the same time, I'm just like, I'm in this situation where I got two kids at home sick today. And I got nobody to answer to because I can do what I need to do, you know, and then I'll go in later tonight and do what I need to do tonight. And everything just keeps moving, you know? So I think about like, I've never worked for anybody in that kind of scenario other than my clients, you know, and my clients usually are the ones who dictate my time and, um, and I'm, I'm okay with that. And now it's just a, a, a balancing act with, that and family and and so now i think about it i was just like i you know i'm i'm approaching 50 this seems like a that'd be a funny time to like go try to make it out there <laughs> 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 what's up world i'm the new kid i'm the new kid on the scene <laughs> i'm 50 years old coming in hot i'm coming in hot <laughs> um i feel you know i like i got I have one of the best studios in, in the twin cities. I have, you know, uh, uh, one of the best jobs on the planet. Um, I don't know what else you need, man. Like other than, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm feeling good about that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. And I, I know so many people that made it outside, you know, develop something of, of their own outside of the system. And it's really challenging and difficult for people like us that have done that, that have created situations where that are perfectly set to our comfort and our sensibilities and sensitivities and our priorities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, it's a, it's it's a really challenging thing. I think I think it's something that a lot of us struggle with, though, because like you know, I've I've proven myself. Uh, you know, I've 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 got real statistics and numbers that I could go in with if I wanted to. And, you know, maybe I yep. could scale this thing or maybe I could do this or that. And yeah, man, when you go and be around that stuff, it's just like, this is so gross though. Like this, this energy is yeah. so weird. And like, I would have to become a different person and I would have to pretend to like and dislike things that I don't. And I, you know, it's, it's just, um, 
It's a really profound thing. One of the things I think about, though, with us, with the artists, is that we go and do these festivals and even operating completely on our own terms, we do have opportunities to tour with or play with or, or meet and work with our idols, like the people that are heroes. Yeah. Like, do you, are yeah. you ever on a panel with Bob Power or do you ever get to, you know what I'm saying? Are, no, man. That's like, I would say that's the like the one downfall of me uh, putting roots in Minnesota. You know what I mean? Like, there's not that community here. Like, if you want that, yeah, you're on the coast. You're... And I remember, like, again, going back and, like, uh, doing a bunch of stuff in New York. And there was a while there where I was going to build a new studio. So I went, I was going out to New York a couple times a month and touring all these different studios. And I'd, like, walk into one studio and, you know, it was, like, a some famous engineer, like, whatever, was mixing the Coldplay record. And right down the hall was Lauren Hill doing a rehearsal for something. And then you know, in walks, uh, what, you know, I was just like, Oh, this is, you know, you're surrounded by this kind of stuff. And it's not like that here. Um, but at the same time, it was like this super hustle, 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 hustle. Like, uh, how much money you got? How much money can we put on this? Like, it just felt weird to me. Uh, and having conversations with people in those environments and, you know, studio managers and that kind of stuff and studio owners out there. I was just like, wait, you got to make how much money a month before you can even pay yourself? Like, that seems nuts, you know? It's just like, I'm okay, man. I'm all right out here, you know, doing my own thing and being like completely self-sufficient and not having to worry about booking my room every day to pay you know to cover my overhead you know like that's it's okay um but yeah the downside to that is i don't get to like rub elbows with all the different engineers that i've looked up to in 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 the past and just been like you know i've met a handful of them at different conventions and things like that and it's always been fun but they're all just like they all have the same vision man they're all just like man we're here to make records and have fun like let's do this you know like you just got to surround yourself with super good, talented people and and the rest will come easy. <laughs> just like, you're right. That's good. That's good advice. And it doesn't matter where you do it as long as you just do it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I but at the same time, like it, it's just made me be more diligent about figuring things out for myself and figuring out how to do things and like teaching myself the right ways to do things or what I consider to be the right way to do things and you know, these mentors that I had taught me a lot, but n taught me, you know, they gave me the right direction anyways. But like, you know, I, I feel like I'm leaps and bounds above where they were at this point in their career, you know. Uh, and, you know, it's because of them. But at the same time, it's because like I got to figure this out and I got to I got to have that drive to keep doing it. And, and you know. If I want to make records, that's a very specific thing. You got to be good at it. So that's what I got to do. You know, with technology, most people record themselves now or record, you know, in makeshift setups or home studios and things like that. Like most yep. people, you know, I, th I think it's only like clients that have like, you know, really big budgets, which like who's got that, you know, nowadays. It's thing of the past. Yeah. Thing most, of the past. Most people record themselves. So... How often are you still in the room with your clients? And does that have a big impact on the music itself? Um, so I, I still have a handful of clients that, um, you know, at, at least at some point in time in the process, still want to be in the room and still like, there's still that feeling of like, we did this thing together, even though like, you know, the six months leading up to this, none of us were doing anything together. It was just like sharing files and going back and forth. Um, you know, I, I think it's still an important part of things, but yeah, because of how everybody is set up now and can do anything and everything, I've just become a conduit for people that need help to do things. I advice on how to do things how can you know can can you help me fix this or f tell me how to do this and then 
you know, provide the services that I can provide for them after the fact. I mean, I, I, I just sent you a project. To, I just sent you a song and was like, hey, don't engineer this, but engineer it. <laughs> <laughs> but engineer it. You know, that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself, man. Like, I love that stuff, you know? And so that, like, that that keeps me that keeps me going that keeps me my my you know my feet moving and i love that um but i i truly love when people are in with me too you know like you know, i still get to record bands every once in a while where um you know you spend three four or five days together and then you just don't see them again and uh whereas 10 15 years ago i was spending weeks mm-hmm. with somebody and it became this like thing where you just like okay we're done at the studio let's go out let's go hang out uh let's get breakfast before we get back in there it you know it's like this family and you just spend all this time with them and then they and then the record's done and then it's on to the next family um so there's less of that um which is maybe more stabilizing i don't know i you know i miss some of those things i miss some of that kind of camaraderie um but I'm also very happy being by myself and making these decisions, you know, and making mixes and and then handing them off to people and being like, this is what I put at it. Like, let me know. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, I still have a handful of clients that like truly believe like when we get to the end of this, we should all hang out together and make these final revisions and, you know, be in the same room and like feed off each other's energy you know and it's ant and laser beak like laser beak is like he wants to be there for all the final touches he really loves to check a box and be like we did that you know and like he's a very energetic happy person when things get done and i think that you know i think it's just this it's this thing when when everybody's like has this sense of accomplishment when that record's done and you're walking out the door and you're just like yeah we just did that and we just made that so I think it's still important, um, but it's, you know, for in my role anyways, nowadays it's, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it's gotten less of a, of a thing. How do you feel when you hear music? Like I hear music with my, you know, my ears are not where yours are, but I hear music where I'm like, oh, this is just a mic in the middle of a big echoey room. Like they're not even trying to pretend that this was <laughs> a studio, you know? And like, I hear yeah, like real official records like that. Yeah. Like, you know, and sometimes there's something cool about it, but a lot of times I'm just like, man, what if, what if they actually would have been in a studio and done this? You know what I mean? Like, what do you, what do you think that's, what kind of impact do you think that that's having on music as a whole that, that people aren't going to the studio? I, I mean, it's, it's disappointing, um, you know, cause there's a, you know there's the 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 perfectionist in me that's like you could capture this amazingly and like make it feel a certain way but then there's a whole another side of me that's just like it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter like you know this person wants to put this song out and and it's more about the the, you know what is being said in the song rather than the fact that they they you know sang into the microphone backwards and that doesn't sound good you know um (laughs) which is unfortunate but it it, you know it's uh i've learned to let it let a lot of that kind of stuff just go you know and and i still really like when i hear a a record that you know there are nerds behind and really appreciate the the sonic texture of things that's the music that i get excited to listen to um you know but every once in a while it's 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 okay to listen to something that's not up to my technical standards <laughs> you know as long as it's still provides the emotion that people need and stuff but i don't know i struggle with it you know i'm back and forth on it all the time yeah like you know i get people that send me vocals that that you know i'm just like why did you why did you do your vocal right in the corner of the room where it's bouncing off of three surfaces and it sounds just so bad and then you're just like it doesn't matter just make it work and then i have to make it work uh as opposed to like something that's just like you know you listen to whatever an adele vocal and you're just like man that sounds amazing you know 
I really, there are people that really love what they're doing behind this project, you know? So I don't know. There's something for everybody, I guess. I still have a lane, you know, I still have a place where I'm still trying to like achieve whatever the artist wants me to achieve for them, mm-hmm. basically. And if that means, you know, dealing with something that was recorded amazingly and just move some things around to get it to come out of the speakers the right way. Or if I got to like really dig deep to find what the gem is and get it to, you know, show its light that way. I don't know. Yeah, man. I'll take any of the challenges. Well, I mean, I think the same way that we were saying with uh, the same thing that we were saying about Ant, you know, that everything he's done, it sounds so different. You know, the, the approach sometimes is different. You know, he'll, do all these, you know, change almost the entire like musical landscape, but there's always something about it. There's always a soul to it where you can feel like this is ant, you know, I would, I would argue that there, that it's that way with your music too, with the music that you've worked on. And, you know, I would, I would say that there's something that is palpable and, 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 you know, you feel it on a, heart level on an energetic level, even if the particular sound might not be the same, you know, um, Mm -hmm. with your music, I do think that there's something that, you know, your stamp and your heart and your soul and your ears and your, you know, it's, it's very clear the role that you've played. And so I just wonder if you, in these last couple moments, if you could give us a sense of what it is that you've tried to bring to the table over the over the course of all of this stuff that you've done. You know, what is the what's what are the priorities? What are the guiding principles that you've brought to the projects that you've done that you feel best about? Hmm. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think you know, more often than I'm, I'm obviously like usually hired as a technician cuz I'm I'm looked at as the guy that can do something that can, that like the artist doesn't want to have to think about or w- want to have to deal with, you know, in the in the whole role of like how do we capture this? How do you make it sound this way? Um so that's you know, I I get hired on as that technical aspect of it. But I think, you know, with my personal background in music and my personal love of music and the way that I feel when I hear music and the way that I, you know, react to music, like all that stuff just naturally goes into anything I do, you know, like be it from what stupid knob I'm going to go turn to like what microphone I'm going to put in front of something to how loud I want to hear something in a mix. Like it all has to do with like the emotion I'm receiving from this emotion that's coming, you know, like, and how I can like then put that back out through the speakers. So I think a lot of the times when I'm doing stuff, I'm not thinking about a lot of things other than like, you know, I'm not trying to be like, "Mm, I wonder what I could do. Like there's so much like, just, I'm just going, I'm just doing things. And it's, you know, I'm doing it because it's what I'm thinking about when I'm hearing this particular sound or this particular lyric, or it's just, it's all based on this emotional kind of, interaction with this song that mm-hmm. I'm working on. So I don't, it, it just all, it just kind of flows, you know, it's all just kind of this natural stride at this point. I mean, it, you know, 25 years ago, it was a lot of tripping and falling and, you know, getting up and taking hacks at things. And now it's none of that. It's just like, it's just all there. It just needs to be moved around and until it's, it's really there. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate it. it. It really means a lot to me that this portion of my life, the portion where I really figured this out, you know, and, you know, also my friends, you know, my dear friends that I did this with, the portion that we were all figuring out who we are and what we sound like and how we want to do this, you know, it really means a lot that we have these documentations of those periods, you know, that like this, this is what mm-hmm. we spent this you know, six months working on and then it's there, you know, and the fact that people have it and listen to it and continue to 
tattoo it on them and everything else is meaningful too. But the fact that we're able to look back on that and and have those things forever, it means a lot to me. Yeah. And you know, the you being the person that facilitated all of that, you know, it that means a lot to me too, man. And I'm Oh man, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. I was just I was just one of the lucky guys in the room, man. Like to be involved in all this talent is was a you know, I'm grateful for it. And I get to keep doing it and keep, you know, making records with people that have the same mindset and people that have the same ideas and and people that drive me to do better things and drive me to make better decisions about music and whatnot, you know, just like coming up in this, all of this, you know, as this community, it was always, you know, it's formed a lot of people. And, and yeah, I, you know, I think about that, like, uh, I, I was having dinner with some people and, um, there was a younger guy there and he, you know, he knows that I'm an engineer. He knows I make records. And he's like, who are some of the people you've worked with? He's, he's like, you work with anybody locally? I was like, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people locally. He, He's like, you ever work with high respects? I was like, yeah, I've made a bunch of high respects records. He's like, oh my God. He's like, Brother Ali? I was like, yeah, made a bunch of Brother Ali records. He goes, my God, man. And he's like, what records? And, you know, we listed them off. He's like, dude, you got me through college. <laughs> and I was just like, huh. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, we made a lot of records and, you know, there's a, there's a whole nother angle to this than, than just, you know, us hanging out in a room making records and, you know, putting art on tape. But there's like these feelings that outsiders are just like, you did this for me. And I'm just like, yeah, that's amazing. And it's, to be involved in that in any, any avenue is just, yeah, I'm super thankful for it yeah. all. And I and I really I know that a lot of our like our ability to find the emotion in those records. I remember we were talking about the Us album. I mean, that was the most insecure I've ever been making an album. Was that album? Remember cuz my voice mm. was just starting to mm. mess up. That's when I was starting to have vocal trouble. And yeah. I remember we went in and I'm my most vulnerable moments on that thing where I was doing Puppy Love. That song Puppy Love. Mm -hmm. And my voice kept cracking. Mm -hmm. And I also was feeling all of this stuff. And I I was just like, I remember I got to the end of a take and my voice was cracking all crazy. And like I, I started to cry a little bit at one point. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this isn't the take. I'm, I'm messing up too much. And so we got to the end. And I was like, I'm really sorry, you guys. I'm, I'm going to do a good one next. Like, let me drink some tea. And you guys were both like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> 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 like you were like he's crying i got goosebumps it's a the rap. dog yeah. it's a rap. <laughs> the dog sat down and started moaning like man we, yeah <laughs> I, I, and you know and and yeah, those man. those you know creating an atmosphere no pun intended where we could really you know be vulnerable and try things and experiment and you know I, I think you have yeah. a, a, a really big hand in that. And that's why I wanted to make sure that your voice and your story and, you know, your witness is, is part of this, you know, this series that we're doing. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I mean, I, you know, again, I just feel fortunate to be involved in this, you know. I, I, uh, I do what I can to, to help facilitate, you know, and, and uh, get the message across so yeah man well i appreciate it very much brother love you a lot man talk at you soon all right man sounds good see ya much love to our friend and our brother and our co-collaborator joe mabbitt for being so gracious and generous with his time with his story with his insights with his wisdom with his perspective and reflections it's a very important part of the story and we're really grateful to be able to document it and to share it. We're brought to you, as always, by the Zakat Foundation. That really means a lot in this moment. You know, these catastrophes happen just like death happens. These things are guaranteed. This life it has a lot of devastation, a lot of loss, a lot of catastrophe. And when these things happen, we scramble a lot of times to say, well, like, what do I do? 
And so that's why Zakat Foundation is important because when these things happen, Zakat Foundation is organized and they're set up and they're ready to help. And particularly with those earthquakes being in my backyard, me living in Turkey and my family living in Turkey and being connected for the past year in this podcast with the Zakat Foundation, and honestly, before that even, but to know that they've got an office in Turkey, president of the company of the organization is from Turkey. And um, so to be able to say like, yo, we're already in place. If you, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And so go to zakat.org, Z-A-K-A-T.org, and put something on that and know that you're giving this to an organization that's trustworthy and that's already set up. And we're also brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. It's a good time <laughs> for as, as beautiful as this situation is. And, uh, you know, the spiritual path is really important. I, I really feel like it's also important to talk to therapists. And I can't wait to get back to Istanbul. And I got a lot to talk to my therapist about. So BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers. We'll get you a discount to start therapy. And then we also get a commission for that to help the work we do here. Much love, many thanks. I'm Namirza Mansour Panawala, Darian Washington, Last Word, Mark from Medina, Ant, uh, who produced the music, everybody that helps out with the podcast, and all the people that tell me that they listen and give me feedback. Shout out to Aida Rashid and to Rami Neshashibi and to Ahmed Fahmi and to Shane Atkinson and uh, Dan Chisholm and all the people that listen and give me feedback. I'm very grateful to you all, and you all are part of this. Traveler's Podcast is produced by BK1, my dear friend, Brendan Kelly, my first DJ. And it is a production of Traveler's Media. Much love to you all. We'll talk next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.